Uh, my name is Dale Crescencio. I am the Director of Stakeholder Engagement in the Office of External Affairs at FDA, and I will be moderating today's call. Thank you so much for joining us today for FDA's stakeholder call to discuss the recent Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 boosters. Today, we are joined by Dr. Janet Woodcock, Acting Commissioner, and Dr. Peter Marks, Director of the Center for Biologics, Evaluation, and Research at FDA. Both of our FDA principals will be giving opening remarks before we move to a question and answer session. As a reminder, this call is closed to media. To ask a question, please raise your hand via the participant tab at the bottom of your screen, or you can also enter your questions into the chat box. Please remember to state your name and affiliation as you ask your question. And with that, I'd like to turn the call over to our acting commissioner, Dr. Janet Woodcock. Thanks, Dale, and hello, everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, on Wednesday, the FDA issued an emergency use authorization for a booster dose of the Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 vaccines for certain populations. And subsequent to that, of course, yesterday, the CDC basically concurred in these recommendations. Uh, and Wednesday's authorization by FDA was for individuals 65 years and older individuals 18 through 64 years of age at high risk of severe COVID-19 due to comorbidities and individuals 18 through 60 years of age at high risk of institutional or occupational exposure to SARS-CoV-2. Um, so we're still continuing, of course, to use science and data to guide our decision-making during this very dynamic and rapidly changing pandemic. Um, and we had an advisory committee, the VRPAC, <clears throat> which demonstrates uh, our process. The VRPAC meeting allowed everything to be discussed in public and, and all the issues to be laid out. And then we took votes on various questions and arrived at um, the uh, recommendations that we then authorized. And we remain committed to a transparent and comprehensive review of all the available data on booster doses as they emerge, because they are just continuing to come forward. So after looking at all the scientific evidence and um, taking into account the advisory committee robust discussion, we amended the emergency use authorization uh, for this vaccine to further protect our most vulnerable populations uh, in whom we felt immunity, uh, waning immunity might be a threat against uh, COVID-19. Uh, we're aware that public's put our, its trust in us to make swift but thoroughly science-based decisions to help lead this country through the pandemic. So <clears throat> I want to take a moment to explain the process and how we use regulatory tools at our disposal to adapt our review and support the EUA in a narrower population than what uh, was originally asked for, uh, for which the scientific evidence of benefit and risk was the clearest. So Pfizer submitted a supplemental application for its approved vaccine to seek approval of a single booster dose about six months after completion of the two dose primary vaccination series for all individuals 16 years and older. And they had submitted a study upon which this supplemental was based. We then scheduled an advisory committee meeting to solicit input from independent experts um, to provide their expertise on the request. And at that advisory committee, not only did we hear from the company and its studies, the FDA presented our analysis of clinical trial data. And we also heard from the CDC, Israel's Ministry of uh, Health, and the University of Bristol at the UK. And they presented a variety of evidence, including uh, Israel's uh, real world evidence on vaccine effectiveness in their country, including their use of boosters. And also, of course, the public was given an opportunity to provide comment. The advisory committee considered all the data and voted against supporting approval booster dose for individuals 16 years and older, given the currently available data uh, some of those individuals were not felt to be at high risk. So um, <clears throat> of uh, you know, a breakthrough infection. 
Considering the committee's feedback, we asked whether the available data supported emergency use uh, authorization for people 65 years and older and people at high risk of severe COVID due to comorbidities. And the committee voted unanimously that the known and potential risks of, of, uh, and um, the known and potential benefits of such a third dose outweigh the known and potential risks. And um, they also, in a separate poll, express support that authorization include individuals at high risk of occupational exposure to COVID-19. So we considered the AC's input information at the meeting, data submitted by the company, and decided that the available data provides evidence that a booster dose of the vaccine may be effective in preventing COVID-19 and that the potential known benefits of such an additional dose outweigh its uh, potential known risks in the certain populations. And those are the populations for which the scientific evidence is clearest at this time. I will note that the evidence is emerging literally week by week, and we are watching this very closely. And so uh, if anything changes, we will modify the, our instructions accordingly. Dr. Marks will share more about the data that we evaluated to come to this, these conclusions. And it's important to note that the uh, authorized uh, vaccine under the EUA is the same formulation as the FDA approved community, and the vaccines may be used interchangeably. So in addition to Wednesday's authorization, this vaccine remains available under EUA for the two dose primary series in individuals 12 years and older, and now as a third dose in the primary three dose series for certain immunocompromised individual. <clears throat> and it's also approved under the brand name community for individuals 16 years and older. And of course, we're reaching out to you because we think this may be somewhat confusing for the general public. Uh, we will post information about this decision and how we came to it and some of the data on the FDA webpage as soon as we can. Um, so uh, as I said, this pandemic is dynamic and evolving as is the information about immunity post-vaccination. So we will try to keep up with this, keep everyone informed, and as more data become available, um, have additional communications and potentially other actions. But of course, in addition to, I don't have to preach here to the converted, but in addition to the third dose, we wanna remind people that getting the primary vaccination into people is of critical importance. So thank you. Now I'll turn to Dr. Marks to discuss more about the FDA's process for approving uh, this uh, emergency use authorization, Dr. Marks. Hey, thanks so much, Dr. Woodcock. Um, it's really a pleasure to be with you today here. Um, just to talk a little bit more about the evaluation of the clinical data for the vaccine, which uh, Dr. Woodcock noted. Um, first of all, the, the, the documentation of our, of our evaluation will be up on our website um, uh, in the not too distant future. Uh, if it's not already up there, I, I did not check today, um, but uh, we are trying to be as transparent as possible about what we are doing here. Um, uh, to support FDA's authorization, uh, we analyzed safety and immune response data um, uh, from a subset of people in the original clinical trial. Uh, in addition, uh, we looked at real-world data on the vaccine's uh, efficacy over a sustained period of time uh, that was provided by both the U.S. and international uh, partners, um, and that included data from CDC, the U.K., and Israel. Um, and uh, in terms of the actual, the actual trial that was done uh, to uh, document uh, the effectiveness in terms of boosting the immune response, um, uh, that involved about 300 people um, uh, ages uh, 18 uh, through 55 and a subset of older individuals as well that was, much, uh, that was, was a smaller group of those, of those people. Um, and they had received a single vaccine booster dose about six months after uh, their second dose, ranged from about um, uh, uh, four and a half to eight months, uh, but uh, with a median of about six months. Um, uh, and as uh, Dr. Woodcock noted, uh, based on the results from that clinical trial, um, uh, which showed that after that 
uh, uh, third dose, the immune response um, uh, essentially more than trebled uh, in, uh, in, in, in its uh, magnitude. So it did uh, as well or better uh, than after the second dose. Um, uh, we determined that uh, the booster dose might be effective in preventing COVID-19 uh, for those who received a primary dose, uh, the primary dose series uh, six months earlier, and ultimately as part of the emergency use authorization that the known and potential benefits of such a third dose outweighed the uh, known and potential risks um, uh, in the populations for which um, uh, it was authorized. Um, uh, so really, uh, the, looking at this in summary, the response that was seen uh, at a month after um, the uh, booster dose, that third dose, um, uh, was, uh, was a significant response uh, and, uh, and met our criteria um, uh, as is noted in our, uh, the reviews that are posted. Now, um, we also, uh, there was also additional analyses that were conducted um, uh, and um, they make us reasonably confident um, uh, that, uh, that even with the Delta variant, that uh, this is, uh, these boosts uh, will uh, maintain the uh, uh, effectiveness uh, of this vaccine because the, uh, the data support the fact um, that uh, this particular vaccine uh, is able to make an immune response, which is able uh, to uh, help combat the Delta variant. Um, uh, Im importantly, um, you know, one of the things that uh, we uh, do know is that uh, the analysis submitted by the company uh, during the study period uh, of July uh, and August 2021 um, is that more of the people who got their primary vaccine series earlier got COVID-19 compared to participants who completed their primary vaccine series later. That's because there was that crossover of people um, who went from placebo to vaccinated. So you could compare the two cohorts um, even within that same trial. And um, uh, that, uh, that rate of breakthrough um, uh, helped us figure out that, you know, if one was vaccinated uh, more recently, one would be more well protected, um, and that potentially the booster uh, could uh, potentially translate into improved effectiveness. Um, so in, in terms of the, uh, uh, the safety evaluation, um, uh, there were uh, 306 participants, uh, 18 through 55 and 12, 65 years of age and older who were followed uh, for an average of over two months. Um, and the most commonly reported side effects uh, in the clinical trial precipitants, uh, per, per, uh, participants were um, the ones very similar to what we're seeing after um, the uh, second dose, uh, including um, uh, injection site reactions such as pain and redness and swelling. Uh, and the systemic symptoms of uh, fatigue, headache, muscle or joint pain. There was one thing that was somewhat uh, more common that was not seen as often in the, after the second dose, which was some uh, swollen lymph nodes, lymphadenopathy um, uh, uh, in, uh, in the underarm. Uh, and that uh, uh, was uh, something that's not unexpected uh, with these boosters, these resolved um, uh, 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 within days. Uh, to a few weeks afterwards. Um, uh, and uh, while the sponsor didn't tell us uh, uh, about data on high-risk populations, um, the advisory committee meeting uh, discussed the data in, uh, in light of uh, giving a benefit, giving a booster dose to specific high-risk populations. Um, and FDA can consider uh, such populations in its decision to amend the emergency use authorization, taking into account the high risk populations like healthcare professionals uh, and those who were living in nursing homes um, and, and did so um, as uh, we uh, took our regulatory action. Um, uh, so uh, it's a couple of just things to finish up on that although it's at least six months, that doesn't mean that if somebody is eight months or 10 months out, they shouldn't receive a booster um, uh, they just need to be at least six months out following the completion of their primary series, um, and uh, it can be administered um, uh, after that time. Um, and um, finally, I think 
uh, you know, with our federal partners, we're gonna continue to watch uh, the safety of this um, uh, vaccine, as Dr. Woodcock also noted. We can't ever re reiterate this enough that obviously we are uh, very uh, much in tune with watching for any safety issues. Uh, we'll continue to watch for any potential risk of myocarditis, pericarditis following the third dose. Um, and um, uh, if we see anything, uh, we will be uh, communicating uh, with the public and also taking action as need, as need be. Um, so really um, uh, what we, uh, uh, the action that was taken this past Wednesday was just another uh, important step in our collective efforts to try to get the pandemic under control, um, which uh, I'm very much hoping uh, that we will all succeed in uh, working together. So I'll turn it back over to Dale. Great, thank you so much, Drs. Woodcock and Marks for your opening comments. Now I'd like to turn to the question and answer segment of our program. And I'd like to call on a few organizations who've been working closely with us on vaccines to ask our first questions. Um, first, I'd like to call on Erica DeWalt, who is the Director of Strategic Communications and Partnerships for Vaccinate Your Family. Erica, can you turn your camera on? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for the opportunity and thank you for all of the careful deliberations and transparency at FDA. It's greatly appreciated. Uh, one of my first questions. So during the VRBAC discussion, it was clear that there's not a consensus on what factor or combination of factors is leading to this rise in COVID uh, cases. So are there specific studies you, you need to see to better understand the need for boosters as opposed to other measures such as, you know, masking and social distancing? Well, if I could start, and then I think Peter as the expert could chime in, but first of all, what factors are leading? Some people uh, thought perhaps it was the rise of Delta. Some people thought it was waning immunity. We have pretty good data on waning humor immunity, and it's waning, <laughs> all right? And particularly Israel um, had vaccinated their older population very early, you know, a thorough amount of them. And they followed the uh, humoral immunity monthly in a cohort, and you could just see it going down. Everyone's immunity, humoral immunity is decreasing over time after vaccination at the, more or less the same rate. But since the elderly started lower, they're hitting a lower point sooner. As far as we can tell, it looks like it's not Delta. Now, Delta requires a little bit higher, perhaps, immunity, more robust immunity. To, it's uh, to the, uh, in response to this vaccine, since the vaccine is actually a slightly different uh, variant. Um, but it appears to be mainly waning immunity that's causing this. So that's the first part of your question. How about the second part? Can you ask that again? Sure. So are there particular studies that you're looking for to better understand as we move forward a mix between boosters versus maybe the need for a new vaccine, particularly as we see variants like mu emerge? Yes. So um, we're watching both the uh, other variants all around the world because we are in contact with regulators and departments of health all around the world. We also now there are assays set up where we can look at neutralization by antibodies elicited from the, um, <clears throat> from the vaccine and how well they neutralize some of these other strains. So we have seen some of that already, even for mu. So uh, what will determine, I think, broadening the need for uh, a third dose in more populations is uh, we know that the younger people are getting breakthrough infections, even though they're fully vaccinated. Question is how many and how serious are they? Are they really, you know, making people sick? And some, and also on the other side with the younger people, of course, for this particular vaccine, myocarditis is a side effect in the younger, more in the younger age groups. And so uh, particularly from Israel, who vaccinated a very large amount of young people with a third dose in their military, uh, in a few weeks, we should have very good data on that. So we'll put all this together. As I said, it's a dynamic situation. We rely on you all and others to explain this to the public because it must be completely bewildering. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Marks, do you have other uh, comments to make on that? 
No, I think you've I think you've just expressed it really well. I think you know this is it is a very dynamic situation um, where I think the data continue to emerge. Even since our VRPAC meeting, more data have emerged, and it's it will I think within three four weeks time will become ever clearer um, uh, the benefit risk here about boosters and if it's appropriate to broaden the booster population to the the general population. We'll take that action, right. um, uh, and uh, I think, it, and there's no magic here. Israel happens to have been about four to eight weeks ahead of us, and so we're just coming along now and starting to get some of those same data here in the United States. And frankly, if we have a variant that comes through that <clears throat> requires higher titers to uh, of neutralizing antibody uh, from a conventional current vaccine to neutralize it, then that will also be a call for higher levels of immunity. Uh, and we could do that before we actually devised a vaccine that actually it, uh, stimulates antibodies specifically against that variant. Great, thank you so much, Erica. Next, I'd like to turn uh, to Dr. Mark Rosenberg, who is the president of the American College of Emergency Physicians for a question. Well, thank you uh, for having me here today. I appreciate the opportunity on behalf of the 40,000 emergency physicians across the country who are the members of the American College of Emergency Physicians. I do have, my first question is a two-part question, if I may. Um, we understand and appreciate the FDA's um, revised the Pfizer EUA to cover booster shots for healthcare workers, including emergency physicians. However, many of our members received the Moderna vaccine. Uh, mm -hmm. What is the timeline for the FDA to modify the EUA for Moderna in such a way as they did with Pfizer? Um, I'll start. Um, of course, we can't give specific timelines. And because we're working based on science, we have to wait till the science comes to us. But we, uh, Moderna has said publicly they have submitted information to us and we understand the urgency of this. Uh, so we'll work on this as quickly as possible. Dr. Marks. Yeah, so th thanks. So that, it, it, just to echo what, uh, what, what Dr. Woodcock said, we, we realized that um, not just Moderna, but also the Janssen vaccines, there are um, two other vaccines that um, there is a reasonable urgency to try to get there. Um, and uh, again, I can't give you exact time, time frame, but um, uh, we're talking weeks, not months before we have a solution here, um, because Frankly, given that Moderna was rolled out a little bit later and there is a hint that perhaps their duration of protection might be a teeny bit longer, um, we feel like that's <laughs> that we, we, we need to get it done um, in that with that type of timing. So we feel the urgency here. Um, and we also feel, might as well take another question, we also feel <laughs> uh, 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 the urgency to try to get the data as soon evaluated as soon as it comes in from the National Institutes of Health probably a little later in October about whether these vaccines can be mixed and matched to boost one another. Mm -hmm. With that said, uh, is there a chance that the Moderna vaccine EUA will not be modified the same way as Pfizer? Uh, will there be different recommendations for shots uh, and will it be slightly different for different populations? Um, so, so actually, good, good question. They, by their own, uh, by what they actually announced, they've submitted a booster dose that is half the uh, the dose that is uh, administered in the primary series. So that may be different, um, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't expect there's going to be a lot different otherwise. Again, we'll obviously have to look carefully at all of the circumstances of their application, but but at least at first glance, um, it, we're, we're going to try to keep these things for. <laughs> the different boosters as close to uh, similar as we can, because um, something I have learned over um, uh, 10 years of coming to learn a, a lot about vaccines is um, if it can get messed up, it will get messed up with vaccines. And so the simpler we can keep things here uh, uh, for people, the better. 
Great, thanks. Um, and last but not least, along those same lines of thinking, um, there does not seem to be enough data to truly evaluate the effectiveness of booster shots in all populations. Um, but going forward, it, do you believe that we will have um, better recommendations for future uh, booster shots, if at all needed, uh, or at least have a mechanism to develop easier protocols rather than trying to put them together as we had to now, of course? Yeah, so I, I think we have a couple, couple things that are going to happen. A, we're going to have more mature data uh, from the booster campaign in Israel, but also we will start to have data uh, from our large database systems, which will be looking at the effectiveness of rolling out boosters in the U.S. population uh, as well. And that's, that's, I think, a very important piece of this. Uh, we continue to work to expand uh, the number of individuals captured by our large database systems. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're currently at the tens, a few tens of millions, and we would like to be at the hundreds of millions. So we're working on that right now. Um, and I think that's going to help us moving forward. Um, it'll also help us ultimately in surveillance of the population as well. Um, uh, so uh, this is, uh, I think, hopefully, I think when we, as I say, a month from now, it'll be better than it was now. And after that, I hope it'll even be better. <laughs> Yeah, and to add to that from a bigger picture further out, I would say right now we don't know if we have a serologic correlate of protection. And typically vaccines are developed, of course, over a long period of time. And we usually have more understanding of the underlying disease and the role that immunity plays before we go about uh, constructing a vaccine. You know, most of these diseases have been around for 100 years or more. So, um, uh, as we begin to learn more about protection against um, the virus, and we learn more about the immune response to the virus, including serologic correlative protection, I think we'll be able to arrive at better guesses at what the appropriate regimen is over time for a vaccination. Great. Thank you very much for your answers. And again, I just want to thank the entire FDA for your hard work and protecting the population, the public, and the frontline workers. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rosenberg. Next, I'd like to um, move to the American Academy of Family Physicians. We have Dr. Amy Mullins, the medical director. Amy? Thank you. And thank you both for, for being here on what has been a crazy and busy last few days for all of us, and especially especially you. Um, one of the things that we are seeing be very confusing for our members is the use of the terms third dose and booster. And the way those two terms have been used sometimes interchangeably when I think they are two distinct, two distinct events and for two distinct things. So if you could speak a, a little clarity around that issue. And then the question I have following that is, for those that have gotten a third dose because of their immunocompromised status, will they need a booster in six months? Dr. Marks, uh, do you wanna address yeah, that? So, I, sorry, uh, I was trying to get, I was, I was muted. It took me a moment there. So, so great question. So this is one of those, um, this is again, something, in a time of transition, because honestly, the reason why we're sometimes calling them third doses um, is because the third dose that's being given at six months uh, may indeed be the third dose of a primary series. So it mm -hmm. may be after this pandemic mm -hmm. is over, much like the hepatitis B vaccine mm -hmm. or the hepatitis A vaccine or any number of other adult vaccinations, there'll be a primary series which needs three doses at zero, one and six months. Um, and so um, it, we sometimes are lapsing into calling it a, a third dose because that's how we think about it. Um, although right now we're calling it a booster and I'll just, I'll, I, without just to be totally transparent, the reason for calling it a booster rather than the third dose of a primary series is we actually don't want to alarm the entire population by suddenly telling them that they're no longer completely vaccinated for the three dose series. Oh, you know, um, 
Uh, so it is a booster for now. And ultimately, we may transition into, uh, into a, a calling it a three-dose series. Now, the point of the third, or the third dose of what might be the early series or a third early dose, um, given a month after or, or so after the second dose uh, in immunocompromised individuals, we're going to have some more data on that, but it, it may turn out that those individuals do need to be boosted. We, we have a little time here because that only started <laughs> about two months ago. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll get that straightened out by, by getting data, um, but um, it wouldn't be shocking uh, if those individuals needed to be boosted uh, after six or more months, mainly because they didn't make a great response in the first place and needed that third dose just to get up kind of close to right. where, in terms of titers, where uh, I, I, an individual who wasn't immunocompromised was boosted to. However, um, you know, the data that we have show that some of those individuals do not respond and you may right. be able to give them numerous vaccinations and they don't respond. And that's where um, you know, we, we will be looking at um, uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis uh, with monoclonals uh, and, of course, their uh, post-exposure and uh, treatment with monoclonals and other, hopefully we'll have some oral antivirals on the horizon, we can only hope, um, because, um, because we're not going to be able to protect everyone with vaccination. And... Um, that's where also a serologic correlative protection would be very helpful. So you could test your immunocompromised individuals to see if they've mounted an adequate antibody response. And if not, they need special treatment. And I think as also as Dr. Woodcock was noting, I think it will probably over the next months be, be able to be somewhat clearer as more data comes out who it's probably not even worth trying to tr vaccinate uh, and who should we should go directly to with one of these prophylactic uh, antibody strategies rather than vaccinate. We already know that, th that, that for instance, people who have been treated within the past year with uh, the anti-CD20 monoclonals typically used for uh, uh, certain blood cancers and certain rheumatologic conditions, that they just will not make a response. And you can vaccinate them three times and they still don't respond. Uh, so we'll probably have a lo longer list of that. Um, can I ask a one follow-up question? I saw Dale just pop back up on the screen, but I, I wanted to, for just so we can all be on the same page and we want to, we want to message how you want us to message so we can all be kind of singing from the same sheet. What should we be calling these? Should we be calling third doses, third well, doses? We, should we, we call can, it we boosters? Call them, we can call them boosters now. That The, 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 the actual label, I, I think probably, I, I I'm, I'm, I'm giving in, I'm giving an, I was probably the one that was calling them the third doses the most. Let's just call them boosters now because that's what the label is calling them. Uh, and that's what everyone seems to, uh, the, the, the general population understands them as they're boosters for now. So boosters Dr. for Woodcock, everybody. You, you, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And well, it makes it easier because when we call these boosters, then we can call for the, for the people with immunocompromised, we can call those third doses then. Okay. okay. <laughs> so we'll call the third dose for immunocompromised a third dose. Okay. And we'll call these boosters. That's great. That's what we've been doing. So that's perfect for us. <laughs> Good. Okay. Dale, do I have time for one more question or is my time up? No, you can, you can squeeze one more in. Okay. So this one should be easy. I just wanted to, um, to clarify, you know, in the recommendation that was just released that those that are at high risk of COVID for occupational, you know, due to occupational exposure and in institutional setting, you know, our members were very concerned that, you know, healthcare workers were not going to be included. Can you just clarify who is in that occupational exposure piece? Well, certainly, yeah. healthcare workers are right at the top of the list. <laughs> yeah, but if, uh, frankly, if I were in a daycare worker, or elementary school teacher, I'd be crowding you because they don't, they can't wear full PPE when they're dealing with all the bodily mm -hmm. fluids and so forth. Go ahead, Peter. I'm sorry. No, you're you're spot on. You you said what I was going to say. I mean, I I I think we were we were concerned here that. Um, there, are, you know, there are balances here. I think certainly healthcare workers need this because they have mm -hmm. they're constantly uh, uh, exposed. Um, 
uh, they have the advantage of perhaps having access to more PPE uh, than perhaps some daycare workers um, and teachers. Um, and so we think that, I mean, it, it, it seems to be a reasonable, uh, a, a reasonable assumption that all of these uh, should uh, have uh, you know, access to uh, being able to boost their uh, immunity. And, and I think, I, I, again, I'm gonna, I don't know this for sure, but when I look at my crystal ball, again, I think a month from now, there'll be some more data out there uh, that will help support that this was uh, a very appropriate decision. Thank you both so much. That's the end of my questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mullins for joining us. Mm -hmm. Now I'm gonna to turn to our chat where we have a couple of questions. The first is from James Blumenstock, I believe from the American Academy of Pediatrics. And he asks if the BLA is for 16 um, or older, why was this booster authorization set at 18 years and older? Uh, I'm okay. happy to take that one. And yeah. that's because when you look but, well, there are two things here. First of all, 16 and 17 year olds, there weren't that many of them that actually were, uh, 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 that were uh, vaccinated early on. Um, and so we have a little more time to figure that out. And, but part of that is that when you look at the benefit risk here, that is the most challenging group to have uh, figured out because the 16 and 17 year olds have the highest incidence of myocarditis in this, about one in 5,000. And granted, it's mild myocarditis. 98% of these, uh, of the, the 16 and 17 year olds who get myocarditis, it's because they have mild chest pain or some EKG abnormality that's detected that goes away within 24 hours and they're out of a hospital, um, usually with nothing more than having taken a non-steroidal, um, if that. Um, so it, those, that's though the reason, um, the, the risk benefit in that youngest population um, is the most challenging to ascertain. And it, we have, a, in, in part, there were not a large number that would be at risk right now. So we have a little more time uh, to do our benefit risk uh, assessment um, in, that, in that population. Uh, the, the benefit, and, and you might have seen if anyone watched the ACIP meeting, there, depending on what age, the older you get, the more benefit you potentially get um, uh, within range. Uh, and, and as you get to the youngest ages, um, it gets to be a little more challenging about that benefit risk issue. Great. Okay, we have a, a couple of questions concerning the minority groups and, and the amount of data that you had um, to support their inclusion. And um, I just wanted to know if you have an, an, an idea of how many people were included in minority populations in the most recent study for booster shots. You know, it was, uh, there was a diverse population. And uh, I, if you give me, uh, why don't we take another question while I just get the number um, <laughs> uh, and I can, uh, I can get that number just a moment for you. That sounds good. Um, there's another question here that talks about just the data that supports high risk individuals receiving boosters. And if you can talk a little bit more about that as well. Yeah, you know, uh, that, that is, that's, that's basically a benefit risk of, um, we know that when certain people get COVID-19, the chance that they will get uh, severe COVID-19 is increased. The chance that that, that, that complications could lead them to an adverse outcome is increased. And so preventing COVID-19 in those individuals is, is doing, uh, is, is doing a, a, a great service. So um, that was the concept here um, of people with pulmonary issues um, uh, uh, and uh, other issues um, uh, to try to prevent, uh, you know, that, that would have put them at risk for a severe outcome. Uh, Dr. Wilcox, do you want to add for that for a second? And I will pull up this while you're adding, I yeah. will pull up <laughs> the sure. uh, numbers here. Well, we know for reasons we, the, we don't fully understand that uh, certain comorbidities place people at a very high risk of if they acquire COVID despite their perhaps young age, they are still at risk for getting hospitalized and perhaps uh, having to be ventilated and so forth. And we've seen 
case after case of that, and we have the data. So although the elderly age itself puts you at a, a high risk, certain comorbidities also put you at a high risk for getting severe COVID. And so it, this is, uh, so the benefit of preventing that is very high. And so bolstering their immunity with a booster shot, uh, the benefits of uh, protection outweigh any foreseeable harms in that population. And I can just, just to get back to that question on the uh, demographics, I, 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 I was pretty sure I was, I, I remembered it, but I, I never wanna speak out of, uh, out of turn here. Um, uh, in terms of the, um, in, in terms of the, uh, the 300 individuals uh, in the uh, clinical trial um, uh, with boosters, uh, it mirrored actually that of the, um, of the actual 44,000 patient trial, about uh, 9% um, uh, characterize themselves as Black or African American. Um, about 28% um, uh, Hispanic or Latinx characterization, um, uh, and uh, uh, about uh, it's about three or four percent here. Um, uh, other other non-white racial groups. Um, so um, uh, that was and that was the kind of distribution uh, that we saw. Uh, in the uh, original clinical trial. So this is, is it kind of reflects um, uh, the kind of diversity um, uh, that we see in the country. And that, that, that's, that's what we asked for in the original clinical trial as well. Great, well, I'm noticing that we're at time and I wanted to give um, Dr. Marks and Dr. Wilcock a chance for any closing comments that they'd like to add. Uh, well, from my part, um, we really appreciate your partnership in all this, uh, especially those of you all represent people who are on the front lines of this pandemic. We're all tired. <laughs> we all need to support one another. Um, the message I think that's important for the population now is, you know, we're very confident on this recommendation. It was made based on science. We will make science-based decisions on the other two vaccines and the people who receive those in the coming days. And we understand the urgency of that. And um, <clears throat> also that really this is a dynamic and uh, fast evolving situation. And we will keep monitoring the scientific uh, facts and what's happening with the population and do everything we can to help protect people against getting sick. So um, yes, as Peter said, we really would need to, to uh, interrupt this pandemic. Dr. Marks? Yeah, no, thanks, Dr. Woodcock. I, I just would echo and just thank you for helping uh, to get people. I think they, it's, you know, we, we I just, it can't go get said enough. We, we need to get boosters and people who need them, but we need first and second vaccinations in the entire population as much as it, we can. Um, I am, a, I, I may be a minority in some, but I believe that if we can get vaccination rates up high enough, we can start to see transmission uh, interrupted. And I think we can actually get a hint of that in certain states where there are now vaccination rates above 80%, yeah. because we can see very sharp declines. Look at Massachusetts and California, for instance, uh, in what can happen in, in states where you get vaccination rates up. So um, I really appreciate all your help with that. And I, I think we have a group of people that are very committed um, to trying to do our best uh, to keep up with very rapidly emerging science. And um, uh, we are also committed to adjusting. If we don't get it right the first time, we will get it right because we will adjust to do so. So thanks so much. Thank you everyone for joining us today and thanks to Dr. Marks and Dr. Woodcock for your time. We know how busy you are. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is recorded and we will be posting it on our FDA website early next week. Thanks again and have a great afternoon. Thank you.